I exist in two worlds. And in one of those worlds, I and the community I'm part of are kind of glum and despondent. It's hard to be optimistic about the future. And in the other world, I and the community I'm part of feel invincible and unconquerable and on the ascendant. I think that captures that. So, to explain. I run the site, Economics Network, based at the University of Bristol, but it's a national international project, and it's the, uh, a leading site for university teachers of economics to find tips and to find resources. And we've had open educational resource projects, we've archived resources created by other, created elsewhere, and we catalog economics resources around the web. Um, so we're part of the university um, open education movement, and if you've been listening to say Pat Lockley, who's, uh, uh, who did a video at the uh, Open Education Resource Conference, uh, it's easy to be very, very pessimistic. This is a graph of uh, the Creative Commons licensed submissions to educational repositories in the UK. And you can see that it spikes heavily around the time there's funded projects with deadlines uh, funded people to produce this, and then it gradually tails off and it gets to now and it's almost zero. And the conclusion invited is, well, we've tried open educational resources and they didn't work. They've turned out not to be sustainable. The production is sustainable, it's petered out. Uh, we haven't had the avalanche of remixes and uh, altered versions. Um, that's what Pat was urging. Uh, that, yeah, we tried open educational resources, didn't work. So the other world is Wiki Wikimedia, meaning Wikipedia and its many sister projects. And uh, Economics Network is, by all accounts, a successful educational site. It gets five or 6,000 hits per month. What I contribute to volunteers of Wikipedia gets read tens of thousands of times a day. Wikipedia as a whole is getting 5,000 hits per second. Uh, uh, Wikipedia, at the end of last year, got the Erasmus Prize. This is a, a prize for outstanding academics uh, say, given to Dan Dennett, the philosopher, uh, given to outstanding uh, people, occasionally to organisations, but in December last year, it was awarded to the Wikipedia community for promoting learning and communication and open dialogue. It, lots of people in the room edited Wikipedia. You, congratulations, you won the Erasmus Prize. And they made this lovely video about the way Wikipedia is helping culture and education. I'll just play a short clip of the education section. extraordinary. It's an amazing group of people who are all around the world, totally passionate about this project, volunteering their own time to produce this website so that everyone can have access to the world's knowledge. There's nothing else like it on the internet today. It's a free and open project both in cost and in licensing, and it's built by a global community of people for a global community of people. I think Wikipedia is important because it does fulfill that longing that again has existed for a century almost, and it began back in the day with people thinking index cards and microfilm would be able to create this international global encyclopedia. Wikipedia actually realized that vision and I tell my students in class, today is going to change the course of your life in that you're going to be contributing to the largest knowledge project in the history of humankind. And that your Wikipedia article could very well outlast, outlive you. It's, it's a momentous, huge thing and very exciting. So the resources you create might outlive you, which is the other end of the scale of optimism. And... Uh, a lot of this material has been created in universities and it's learner-created content, which is part of the, the promise to offer of the open education revolution. These are figures from uh, the Wiki Education Foundation. Uh, so 14,000 students involved. Uh, it'd be 20 million characters of text added. 
Um, and I believe these numbers just relate to North America. So that's just, it's just a North American phenomenon. Uh, these are uh, universities in the UK which have uh, run Wikipedia assignments or are planning to, I think the other ones, uh, or are currently. So if you read about villages in the north of England, you're often reading content by Portsmouth University students. If you read about the psychology of identity, you're often reading about content, you're reading content put there by Southampton students. Um, and if you do read about the psychology of internet usage, you're reading content by students at the University of Hull. And I came across this as a volunteer Wikipedia editing psychology articles. Pardon me. So, internet addiction disorder. There was a group of three students who worked really hard on this. They, worked, they put in lots of hours, lots of hours into addiction disorder. I had to worry about them. Uh, instead, you can go on the talk page of the article, and there's usually a, a little badge there saying that it's been improved by a course. And in this one, there were two courses. So, and this often happens, that something will be created by students at one level in one institution, and then improved or reviewed by students at another level in a different institution. And we get some nice surprises. Uh, so I've got a bunch of anecdotes. I'll just focus on one. So this is someone assigned to read a Wikipedia article that she'd written. She joined a, uh, was it, an athletic, analytical environment course as a master student. And on the, the first item on the reading list was a Wikipedia article about the topic. And the course leader said, this is Wikipedia, but it's actually a good overview for the article. And she said, I wrote this because in her final year undergraduate, her previous course, she'd been assigned to write this article. And she told the course leader, and the course leader got her to give a, a guest lecture in this course that she just joined. Um, Wikipedia's volunteer base is notoriously overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly weird, as in white, educated people in industrialised rich democracies. But, uh, and weird, <laughs> no insult to... Uh, the Wikipedia community. But with educational assignments, it's different. Edu Wiki educational assignments are participated by a majority of women and create content about uh, a lot of topics that, with the best good in the world, are mainly male, mainly white uh, volunteer based, would take a long time to get around to at best. Uh, so Diana Strassman, the, the academic, has allocated her. Uh, students to write articles about a lot of topics affecting women, including this one about the Arab Spring. So the Arab Spring created an optimism about women's rights, but it actually gave uh, more power to sort of religious fundamentalists and the step back. And this is all detailed with references in this article. So universities are actually creating a huge amount of content. That content is open by every standard. It's available. Uh, to everybody, it's going to translate into different languages, it has a global perspective. Uh, so it seems like the promises of the open education revolution, if you, if you go back to the Down Declaration, Paris Declaration, and whatnot, seems to be coming true. I recommend the video clip I've got, doesn't play very well in here, but the documentary Life in a Day, which came out a few years ago, showing how, how people live around the world in one day. They interviewed this boy, Abel, in, uh, in Peru. And this is his this wooden truck, this is his toy that he takes around with him, and he's asked what he loves. And first he says, I love my dad, because he lives with his father, his father feeds him, his father works to provide for him. Um, and then he goes into the, the shack where he lives and he brings out his laptop. He says, the thing that I love most is my laptop, because it has Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is a giant library for every topic. So he is a recipient of the one laptop per child project which gave these free uh, cheap laptops to lots of kids uh, with a customised child-friendly version of, of Wikipedia on it. So the source of that has to be something you can use without licensing. It has to be multilingual because he doesn't speak English. It has to be customisable without permission to make your, your child safe customised version. So this is content being produced in an educational process <coughs> by learners and reaching the widest possible audience. And there are good stories of sustainability coming out of this. So the, the finance and economics experimental ex experiments lab at the University of Exeter, back in 2007, 2008, 
was writing up their guide for uh, economics experiments as a, as a classroom technique. So you're teaching economics as a laboratory subject. And they decided to put it into a sister project of Wikipedia, which is Wikiversity. And despite the, well, anyone can edit, there's an edit button, won't it degrade over time? The Wikipedia first community welcomed it. They've, they've it's kept going, it's still there. Uh, a lot of minor uh, punctuation errors have been fixed. It's been branded a, a quality resource, the Wicked Thurston's uh, very grateful for it. And, but it still exists. A lot of other educational projects of this vintage had custom domains and had their own site, and maybe it's now no one's job to maintain it, so it, uh, the, the site gets switched off. And this is a uh, term of something being rescued. So I found this, again, to volunteer that this, uh, so resources from 2004, I think, um, about uh, the, the system in the United States and how it works with uh, disadvantaged economically and politically of African Americans. Uh, but, and I, I was reading this after the Ferguson riots, I thought that people probably should be aware of this and should probably be on the agenda of debate. But you can see the design has aged. What you can't see is that the navigation didn't use hyperlinks. It used a flash-based system, uh, which is probably really cool and new at the time, but now doesn't work in a lot of browsers. So people couldn't actually navigate to this, this content. And the uh, two authors have moved on to different jobs. One of them isn't an academic anymore. Uh, and the Creative Commons uh, license wasn't there. It was, it was just default. There's no copyright statement, so you have to assume it's all rights reserved. You've got no right to copy it. I got in touch with the authors, fortunately, and fortunately they still could access the server and just edit it to put in the Creative Commons uh, license, which gave me permission to copy it to Wikibooks and to rebuild it in a more sensible thing. For things. It's incomplete because some of what they're working with was copyrighted uh, images and data from the New York Times. So it's partial, but this is a more lasting thing than the, the flash-based system on uh, a 2004 server. So these things are all on platforms that don't show up on Pat Lockley's graph because they're not in a repository. And the huge volumes, sort of tens of millions of characters, stuff that would be huge if you put it out, is not showing up in the graph of how much open education resources have been produced. I don't conclude that it's open education is failing, I conclude we need to rethink repositories. And Histopedia as well, I, I, I think this is the most powerful demonstration of open educational content and remixing, and it's really great. I'm not doing it here because the internet connection is dodgy on this laptop, but you can go to histopedia.com slash timeline and type in a category name from Wikipedia. So I put in Age of Enlightenment, or you could do Battles of World War I, or you could do Composers for Loot, and pretty much instantly comes up this interactive timeline that you can scale through. It's made from text from Wikipedia, images from Wikimedia Commons, and data like foundation dates, birth dates, publication dates from Wikidata. So it, it's a demonstration you do in a few seconds, and it's really impressive. And it's one of the things that Wikidata enables fantastic project we'll have a session on tomorrow. So what number do we put in the graph of Histropedia? How many extra educational resources are there because of Histropedia existing? Arguably zero, because it's, it doesn't contain educational content, it's merely a software layer over stuff that already exists. Or you could say thousands, because any category on Wikipedia, and there's, there's many thousands of them, can be made into a timeline. Or you could say, because it's customizable, because you can take any combination of Wikipedia articles and arrange them to make the timeline of the concept you want to talk about, you could say it's an astronomical number. So um, it's just hard to count or, or put a label on what, uh, what open educational content this represents. But I want to talk about preserving for the long term. And so a bit of theory. On a distinguished preserving the utility of the resource from preserving the resource itself. So for some things, they coincide. If I sign up to a contract and put that contract in the repository, when I want to get the repository, when I want to get the content back, it's got to be the same, otherwise it's useless. 
that any change is bad. We all know that just changing even one letter of a text can completely change the meaning and significance of that text. And that applies to things like a contract and maybe primary data and, and uh, some things, but not to everything. If I've got a, a current affairs portal, news.bbc, and I go there and it's the same as it was yesterday, it's useless. Um, I'm going there particularly to find what's happened in the last 24 hours. It's got to change to be useful. And I argue that open education resources are somewhere on the continuum, that they've got to change to be useful over time. Uh, so there's probably a multiply peaked function in hopefully it's intellectual diversity and something created to illustrate uh, the, the, the points of the dominant theory will be used to apply it by somebody and will be used to critique the dominant theory in some other course by some other academic. So I posit this spectrum of things that... Um, of, of what you need to do to preserve the utility of these, uh, of these types of resource. And especially with economics, a lot of economics stuff is applying economic theory to things in the news, so it's got to change really rapidly. But even core, how you teach the, the core workings of the theory will change over time. Uh, what illustrates that quality is a moving target really well is quality on Wikipedia. So we have on Wikipedia these formal review processes. Only about half a percent of the articles have been through them. But uh, an article can be labelled good article or featured article, and there are different criteria for them, and someone uninvolved with writing the article comes in and assesses it according to criteria. Uh, if you go to the talk page of an article and click on where it says article milestones, you get this list. And what this list is a history of the review processes the article's been through. For each one, you get a link to what the article was like at the time it was submitted for review, and then the link is actually to the review, so it's, it's done in public, you get the, uh, the, the concerns raised by the reviewer and any changes needed, and you get the debate between the reviewer and the authors, um, and you see what the outcome was. So you can see what was submitted to review, what the points brought up in the review were, and then what changes are made as a result. And this is an interesting history because this was awarded a good article, in 2006, then delisted, the, the good article badge was taken away in 2007, and then put back in 2009. These badges can be taken away, partly because a lot of extra content of low quality, people might write a lot of extra stuff into the article and it's poorly written, so the article no longer deserves a good article. Sometimes the quality scale moves up, so featured articles being redefined to be a more demanding level, so articles we debadge. Or the quality level can stay exactly the same, and the article can stay exactly the same, but uh, facts move on. So there was a, a, a top quality article about UK corporation tax, and it's not changed, but UK corporation tax works differently, so it's no longer a top quality comprehensive article. But having given this spectrum, I've put a few things uh, quite far down the spectrum needing change that maybe you'd think you don't need to uh, edit at all. I'm going to give an example of editing legislation because, and a couple of you have seen this before. Um, June of last year, the Supreme Court of the United States handed down the decision in Obergefell versus Hodges, which was the decision legalizing same-sex marriage across the United States. And the judgment itself was quoted widely on social media, people really liked the way it was worded, was available, it's, it's openly available, and it's a PDF from the Supreme Court website. But it's a PDF that's not ideal, it's a very self-contained thing, and my experience with official URLs is that not very stable, even for important documents. Um, but because of the... the copyright status works the federal government's public domain, I can copy this into Wikisource. Wikisource is the free library where people transcribe out of copyright but published text. And often this is transcribing uh, out of copyright books and pamphlets from image scans, but you can uh, copy uh, text from elsewhere. So I could give it a context. I could give it information as to what this is, its significance, link to things like the Wikipedia article, uh, 
And the document itself makes a lot of references. It refers to um, Confucius and Alex de Tocqueville on the, the cultural significance of marriage. It refers to a lot of other judgments. So it refers to Loving versus Virginia, which is the judgment that established uh, interracial marriage. Uh, so if you know all this stuff, great. But you might not know. So it's kind of a, 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 a cost of entry that you have to know this cultural and legal background to understand the document. But it's easy to, to make more accessible. You can't edit the actual wording, but you could, Wikisource allows you to add links. Links to Wikipedia articles, links to other bits of Wikisource. So I could link to the text of the other judgments or link to the profile of Confucius and say who that is. So rather than being a barrier, this is something that people could come with any level of prior knowledge and learn something from. And it can be tagged, so I tag it as Supreme Court decisions on civil rights. Uh, there are other uh, texts like declarations of human rights, like UN documents, that are referred to in legislation, and you can actually make it a link so people can find the thing with one click. Uh, the other thing I've been doing on Wikisource is uh, uh, women's rights and the emergence of feminism in the 17th and 18th century. Not my area, but I'm learning as I go. And, and one of the texts was uh, this tribute by John Duncan, this poet who thought that, um, who argued that uh, women, given the chance, would be just as great philosophers and great poets as men, and gives a lot of specific examples of uh, women he thinks of geniuses. And, uh, but, again, if, you, if you're immersed in mid-18th century poetry, you'll know who he's talking about and you'll know his references. A lot of the, the poets he refers to are, are by pseudonyms. Uh, so uh, with a bit of detective work or a bit of consulting modern scholarship, I could find out who he's talking about and make links. And they didn't have a profile on Wikisource or Wikipedia could create one. And in one case, so I created this, uh, this profile for an author he mentions, and then uh, he mentions poems. So one of them I found on Internet Archive, as you copyright text, I can transcribe it. So this gives a richer context for the poem, that, that you can see if you agree with Duncan, and you can see uh, uh, this is a particular genius poem, and um, uh, well, you can learn from it whether you're uh, navigating back to curiosity or whether you're being assigned as part of a course. And I hope this work lowers the threshold for running a course on this area of poetry. Um, so that's what I mean by a web of knowledge. I don't think anybody has the, the uh, totally atomistic view of educational content, but uh, this is more about linking things up to make a web of 17th century literature or a web of civil rights legislation or a web because these authors mention each other, pay tribute to each other, cite each other. And that doesn't mean I'm, uh, that I'm taking a totally holistic, that we've got to evaluate and preserve the entire web. Uh, Prof. Tard, who wrote a wonderful book, said that holism and reductionism aren't the only options. You can have reductio, reductionism and holismianism. So uh, what you have with wikis is you've got a unit of content which has a set of links to other things and expects other things to exist. They may be profiles and identifiers or expl explanations of key concepts. And uh, so they build up, and you evaluate the quality of that chunk, and you provide provenance and quality information for that chunk. But, uh, and these things link together, but not in just any way. That there's different ways to link the content together. <coughs> And to talk about preserving the ability of things to change, I want to talk about a couple of, of uh, publication processes, which we call Journal to Wiki, or if you want to be really buzzworthy, J to W, uh, and Wiki to Journal. So on Wikipedia, you cannot publish original research. That's one of the community guidelines. Everything has to have been published already in a scholarly source and cited. What the the editors of this journal have done, uh, plus computational biology, is uh, very clever. They've invited uh, what they call topic papers. So papers that are not an answer to new research, but reviews of a technique or a phenomenon or um, a, a practice in computational biology. 
they have their own wiki, so they've got the open source software in Wikipedia and made their own wiki, uh, and th this is publicly viewable, but not publicly editable. So it's just restricted to the editors and authors of the journal. And they create their review paper, and they get feedback on Wikipedia's house style to make it Wikipedia compatible. And once they're happy with it, it's submitted to the journal in a normal way and gets published in PLOS Computational Biology. So it, it's citable, it's, it's, uh, it looks good in the CV, it's, it's uh, a, a paper published by these often early career researchers. But it's Wikipedia compatible in terms of license, in terms of its style. Uh, so it's pasted straight into Wikipedia as an article. So they've got two publications. They've got the citable, looks good in an academic CV paper, which we know is fixed, and we've got the Wikipedia article, which has had lots of incoming links, uh, and be part of a web of knowledge and that people can stumble upon, and is freely available, and in a platform where it will probably be translated into lots of other languages, and the figures from the article have been uploaded to Wikimedia, so they can be used in this article and used in related articles. And a badge has been added to this article to indicate that it is a copy of a particular open access text and to give that full citation. So that there's one of the, every two or three months, there's probably about a dozen now uh, just in this field. And so they're, they're putting information openly accessible where people can stumble upon it, who are maybe potential students or potential researchers of this and raising awareness of computational biology and its methods. This article on Wikipedia will evolve, and people will edit it and change it, but that's a good thing. People will find better ways to phrase the text, uh, new discoveries will make new citations that have to be added. Over time, this will evolve and be more current than the, the journal published article. And you can do the reverse. So, as I say, you can't publish original research on Wikipedia, but to a doctor, the latest peer-reviewed research paper isn't that useful because they need some of context what else has been researched about this topic and so on. What's useful is a clinical review. So looking at the best sources, the best systematic reviews of medical literature about the identification, treatment, <coughs> prevention of this disease. And so a bunch of authors on Wikipedia wrote a clinical review for, for this disease reviewed it with the, the featured article review, the on-wiki review processes, and submitted it to a journal. Went through a very tough peer review process, three reviewers, they had lots of change, suggested changes. Those changes were fed back into the Wikipedia article to improve it, and it was accepted, it was published. So they've got, again, a Wikipedia article which is evolving, a fixed, citable, paper publication which looked good in CV. A problem they had was who to credit as the author. Because you can go to, you can click on a Wikipedia article on view history and then uh, revision, uh, revision history statistics. It's a really counterintuitive uh, link. It doesn't suggest that there's anything useful there. But if you follow those links, you get this statistical breakdown of how the Wikipedia article was made. And as of last week, there have been 3,398 different versions of the Dengue Fever article made by uh, 1,417 authors, not all of whom are human. There were robots co uh, correcting typos, reverting vandalism, correcting uh, various errors. So uh, you can look at the main authors, you can look at the authors ordered by how much they've contributed. And so there are basically four authors of the main academic content of this, and they're credited in the journal. Uh, James is a doctor in Canada's health service. Jacob is a doctor in Britain's NHS. And I think the other two are biomedical researchers. But, but thank goodness for socialised medicine and doctors who see themselves as public servants. So the, the journal had to note, these are the four main authors, but there were 1,200 other contributors, humans and bots, to this article. But again, immediately, the, the journal article that we know is peer-reviewed is more useful. Over time, new things will be found about dengue fever, the Wikipedia article will evolve, the journal article won't. And I recommend the editorial by Open Medicine where they explained why they had published this. Um, and they, they raised the idea that 
The article will evolve on Wikipedia. Maybe it could be submitted again in future and be reviewed again and published again to get a different you know, publication, DOI. Maybe that will be an ongoing process. That what we know about dengue fever will change. Hopefully, some of these diseases will become historical diseases like smallpox that were conquered. And, and they're optimistic about that because we have this platform to freely share to billions of people the way to prevent, identify, and treat this disease. So if you can't beat them, maybe join them. And I say that both as a Wikipedian looking at higher education and someone in higher education looking at Wikipedia. This is the TRIP database which searches medical sources and uh, orders them by evidential significance. So it's got the systematic reviews at the top and review papers and then individual research reports. But also other kinds of medical sources like patient information leaflets and so on. And they've made a conscious decision to include Wikipedia articles, in, but only the ones that have, have been through the featured article or good article review process. So there's been some check. And on economics network, there's not many examples, but if uh, something's been through featured article review on Wikipedia, we will catalogue that as a resource. It would probably be better than a lot of, a, a lot of things created by academics. So, what you've really been looking for, ladies and gentlemen, at last, bullet points. <laughs> what I'm saying is that, um, actually, despite the grass, despite the... Uh, the pessimism, more open educational content is being created now than ever before, by a huge margin, huge amounts of it were not, that's difficult to quantify, uh, but it is an explosion. And the promised benefits of open education are starting to materialise. Um, Learning creative content, huge, huge quantities uh, across loads of different subjects, changing the, the public uh, discussion about topics by, by creating things that people can st stumble across anyone in the world with an internet device. So, uh, but preserving it means preserving people's interest and investment in it, which means preserving the ability to change. And it's maybe installing repository software and loading zip files into it with IMS metadata and putting uh, uh, having PMH metadata harvesting. Maybe that's not the way to do that. The successful platforms have this web of knowledge aspect and give people the, the edit button. I want to edit your site. I want to edit legislation. I want to edit the search papers. I want to, to edit. Give me the damn edit button. But things, please. No. Uh, these things aren't repositories in a traditional sense, but they are where people are going to and where people are putting their open educational content. And educational content isn't one thing. It overlaps with secondary data, it overlaps with research reviews. So we need publishing models to reflect that things can have different roles. And I've suggested we're starting to have publishing models. And then that's my, if that, that's, I think that's closer to the truth, if it if it's, might be rather optimistic, closer to the truth than the pessimistic and negative idea that it hasn't worked. But that's me, and please give feedback on Twitter, and I invite questions. Thank you. Don't ask a question. I've won. I've. I've. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I've deliberately less of time for audience contributions. It's not a uh, running out of. So, so there are permanent identifiers for everything. So um, again, there's, there's so much that's there, but it's not obvious because usability is kind of 
useful because it is, it is 1997 era software that's not really been updated. So take the, the three and a half thousand different versions of the, the Dengue Fever article. Each of those is bookmarkable. So each of those has the name Dengue Fever, but there's an identifier um, and you they, it, make a URL with that identifier and retrieve. So you can go back and scroll back in time to 2001 and find uh, what the article looked like then. So uh, th this has come up in, in uh, universities when we talk about uh, wiki educational assignments. And uh, the authorities ask, uh, will we be able to look, say, see what Wikipedia looked like at this point in time? And actually, it's better than VLEs because VLEs can have an update that changes how the software works and you can't reconstruct what the course looked like uh, in the previous semester. Whereas you can go back to 2001. So if you go to a page and uh, in the left bar there will be a permanent link. And you can go and that will be the link to the particular identifier. So you can bookmark the article and when you come back to that, that will be changed by whatever change process. Or you can bookmark the, the permanent link and that will be as it was at that time. Um, yeah, uh, so each article has a history, where, as in the, the list of all edits have been made to it and all authors have contributed to it. And so there are tools like the Revision History Statistics tool, which gives you an overview. And because it's all open public data, you can, you can build different scripts onto it to extract that different kind of data. Uh, so you can get, from one of these permanent identifiers, you could get a list of all the, the authors who contributed. Uh, but it works in the principle that, uh, that people say as much or as little about themselves on their user profiles as they want. So a lot of the people say working on medical articles are actually doctors and biomedical researchers and so on, and will put that. And some are, so I've spoken to people who do animal research I want to contribute to animal research articles on Wikipedia. Don't want anything about me personally on their user profile. Don't want to be identified, but they are experts. So you'd get this information about users, but it, some would be useful, some not. Thanks. Hi. What sort of data I didn't catch? Um, it's it's so vandalism does happen. Um, the example I like is yellow lines. So, so say you show somebody yellow lines on the road and they've got double yellow lines and they don't know what that means. And you say, can you park here? And they go, yeah, I can park here. The yellow lines don't stop me. I'll just drive my vehicle up onto these lines. But you say, no, actually, you can't park here. Physically, it's possible for you to park here. But actually, if you do, you'll be in all sorts of trouble. You better not. And so can you go in and delete a whole article or change the year of the American Revolution to 1979? You can technically, but there are bots watching this, watching for for particular changes, and, and vandalism has a particular pattern. Um, uh, there, are, there are people, there's always people somewhere in the world who speak English, who have computers, who run Wikipedia, who are monitoring. You can chair, as a logged in user, you can select a range of articles to monitor and to be notified of any change to them. So I'm interested in mainly economics and psychology, so I get notified of changes to those, hundreds of those articles. And between that, so it, it, and there are contribution records. So as well as the record for an article of everyone who's contributed to it, there's a the record for a, a contributor of everything they contributed to. So if somebody's just going around diff, different articles putting the word bum in, their contribution record would just be the word bum in. <laughs> and so that makes the, that transparency. And this is, yeah, we need to put this somehow into the academic uh, the things we're building in higher education. I think these contribution records, um, 
our, our way to do it. Um, but yes, yeah, so it, so it's put me at gist. Somebody said, you, you, wicked data sounds tempting fate because you're putting lots of data in a place which is editable by anyone on the computer. And, and okay, yeah, but you make one, uh, this database, that the only approved experts can edit, and Wikimedia will make one anyone can edit and anyone can put stuff to, which are you betting will be the, the one-stop shop that everybody goes to and everybody builds their software on? Well, we, we know it's already happened. So there's different, so um, there's a lot of different ways to handle uh, this image. Part of it's with community standards, like my analogy of the double yellow lines. So you could have people changing the article, I think it's better this way, and no, it's better the way it was before. No, it's better with this in going back and forth. But if that happens, all the participants are blocked temporarily and told to just calm down and take a break. So we have the talk page. Every article has a talk page, which isn't for comments about the topic. It's for discussing how to improve the article. And people are expected to, to talk out their disagreement and to talk from sources. So not, I really believe, all my life I've believed that, so I've personally experienced that so it has to be this way. It's, let's look at academic textbooks, review papers and such on this topic, and what balance do they give and what wording do they give? But you can do it other ways. So you can have, so Wikipedia doesn't allow what's called content forks. You can't have um, uh, a, a psychology topic from a behavioral uh, uh, perspective and the same thing from a cognitive perspective. The different parties have to work out together how to create an article about that thing. With, um, but you could have, Wikibooks is more difficult. So you can more sort of mark off areas of Wikiversity and Wikibooks say we're going to create this perspective on this thing. Uh, so it's down to the community standards you create. I think people think it's about installing the software, but no, there's the whole other layer of stuff you've got to do on top of it. With Wikidata, there's complications like how many countries are there really in the world? There's not one definitive number, because there's different sources of totally different things, and some countries refuse to accept Palestine, and some refuse to accept Israel, and, and so on. Some, won't count minor territories. And the way to do that in wicked data is that you can have multiple values for an item, but with different sources. So you can say, according to the CIA fact book, it's this number, and according to the UN, it's this number. Um, but then the software and the people consuming that have got to treat that, and, and bear in mind that since the end, and say Google, not they get you put into Google a number of countries, and it comes up with one number. So we should be consuming this data in a more intelligent way. I can hear you. I think the librarian is the natural ally of the Wikipedian because we're both communities that, that use incredible pedantry for public good. <laughs> and so uh, librarians, uh, Brian Kelly did this blog post that, uh, of uh, the attributes of a librarian and the attributes of Wikipedian, and they map perfectly. Um, I, although he, he doubted that, that Wikipedians are interested in books, but in my experience, Wikipedians are really interested in books. I'm more interested in my book collection now and digging through it as a Wikipedian. So librarians, I, I've had the greatest negativity and also the greatest positivity from the, the academic librarian community in doing Wikimedia outreach. And some see it as kind of threatening, they see themselves as kind of gatekeepers to expensive databases and tools and... Um, uh, we're not going to bother with this freely available public stuff. And some see them sort of curators and spreaders of knowledge and enablers of digital literacy. And here's something where you can teach them literacy because the publication process is open. 
It's not like the textbook. You get the textbook, and there's been an editing process, there's been controversy, but you don't see that, you just see the finished item. With Wikipedia, you can actually see the battles being fought, like, like different factions trying to fight um, over that. So, um, learn about these hidden pictures, the reviews, the article histories, the, the debates, the controversy, the, the, the different quality standards, and teach students this, and teach them to... Uh, yeah, that's a crucial part of induction, that a lot of educators and I've read in universities and schools are still trying to tell learners to, to pretend Wikipedia doesn't exist. Don't use it at all. And then, uh, and then they'll, they'll have a question like, an assignment like what political philosophy is John Locke associated with? And the student goes and searches Google and takes them to Wikipedia about John Locke and it says, uh, and it gives the exact form of words to answer the question. So they copy that and, put, and they get marks for it. So they're told not to use Wikipedia, but they're given marks for using it. That's bad. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. We have to engage with it, including uh, pointing out its faults, which is fine. As for the, the, the mountains of stuff, digital and books that the academic librarians are sitting on, yeah, open that up. I open up events where people come in and photograph special collections and, uh, and actually encourage them to upload to Commons. So I've just written a book chapter about DIY digitization and some special collections invite the public in and say, bring your phone, photograph a document, um, but, but keep the, the image to yourself or only share it under a, a fully copyrighted license. And uh, no, you, if, you, if you have that, that gift of being able to interact with this physical document, this piece of cultural heritage, Give that opportunity to other people. Don't restrict the benefits to yourself. And the best way to share that with other people is put it on Commons, tag it for all the identifiers for where it came from, where this physical thing is. And yeah, give us your stuff. Give us your stuff, please. Uh, the I used University of Bristol electronic resources to improve Wikipedia, and that's probably the the application of some of those resources that gets the biggest readership. Like I say, tens of thousands of people a day. So don't treat it as something embarrassing. <laughs> or, or, uh, simply, but that's the main function of the library in preserving that knowledge and that scholarship. Sorry, it's a bit of a rant, but you <laughs> need some options. Yeah. Oh. Thanks a lot. So uh, the open access agenda and open access requirements for the REF and for HEFKE and so on are a huge opportunity because Wikipedia and Wikimedia can only accept free cultural works. So they have to be uh, allowed for, um, they, could, they have to be reusable and remixable by anyone for any purpose. So they can't be a no derivatives clause, they can't be a non-commercial use clause. And that uh, gold open access under the, the open access regime it has a CC by or a Wikipedia compatible license. Um, research outputs with a Wikipedia compatible license is a huge opportunity, like I gave the example with, with journal to wiki publication. That if you've got uh, an article with that license, uh, then you can copy in the figures and use them to make a Wikipedia article. You can copy in bits of text maybe uh, take out some of the jargon. And that is already happening. So a lot of articles on Wikipedia about ants and other insects are actually made from repurposed research articles. And so people take bits of text and copy it in and then prominently credit the article. So that's impact. That's putting research where it will be found by the public and shape public debate. Uh, and we know how many politicians have plagiarised Wikipedia and speeches. So we're putting it in research where politicians and their researchers will plagiarise it from. Um, it seems to be the most, the most efficient impact. So, so it's a huge opportunity. Um, yeah, p making research outputs with a mind to whether they're Wikipedia compatible. Secondary data can go on Wikidata, source text can go on Wikisource, um, and figures can be reused. Uh, so one of my contacts is a protein scientist, and they wrote... Uh, paper about 
uh, urinary proteins on uh, that was published in PLOS, but for extra impact, copied the, the figures into Wikipedia, copied some of the text, basically made a Wikipedia article about this topic, and put it through featured article review, and it got on the front page of Wikipedia. So, and he reckons he's got lots more citations because even scientists and researchers use Google and go to the first thing Google recommends, which is Wikipedia, and, and uh, find this. So, uh, yeah, I think the institutional drivers are now pushing towards Wikimedia compatibility being just something that was thought of as part of research publication. There's another... I think there was... Somebody here, and then somebody in the back, and then somebody there. So I tried. So I have a background in Hebrew, so I was trying to rank the community and the institutions, and, and uh, it was very, very difficult. What are they? What are the? Why do people engage with you? Um, that's a really good question. I won't pretend to have the full answer to it. It's more like here's the question. Here's what we should be learning from, and I don't know yet what we should be learning. Um, I think things like the, the transparency, like the contribution record, is an example of that. So if you're making a, a succession of valuable additions to things, like you're adding citations to, to really good peer-reviewed literature, that's visible on your user profile. And if you're putting the word bum in, that's visible on your profile. And so it's gamified in a sense that people are getting each interaction, people are getting sort of a positive kudos, positive karma from it, or negative. Um, critical mass has a lot to do with it. So, I don't know how we do that, whether we join things up, or whether we, we avoid the fragmentation, we do things that are bigger than institutional scale, but at subject scale, or sector scale. Uh, or, but speaking to Wikipedia, or we just we just piggyback on successful communities that already <laughs> already exist. Um, I think that yeah, the transpect that, that, that what people what users contribute has to be visible. I uh, think to is to make things to think oh that we want to hide this away, we want to hide this mechanism away, and just present the end result to, people, to users, and actually you know that you've shown the mechanism and, the, and what's going on, and that gives a basis for a critical judgment about the end product, because they can see how it's made. You know what, uh, the, what the Germans say about sausages and legislation? Mm -hmm. That people who love them shouldn't watch them being made. And I think the opposite applies to textbooks and scholarship and, and all of that stuff. You've got to see the process to, to understand the end result. Do Wikipedia editors basically use Orchid? Orchid, we love Orchid. We love identifiers we, of all kinds. Uh, I've got, if you go to my user page, I've got my Orchid number on my user page and on my Commons page. Uh, and uh, if you go to the biography, of a prominent researcher who has an ORCID, hopefully the ORCID will be there, or there is a template to put that in. And in Wikidata, you can, there's a field where you can attach ORCIDs to people. We love that sort of stuff. That linking in of something community created to the scholarly authority. Yeah. Okay, sure, I'm not keeping track of time. You may have to drag me off stage, because I can... <laughs> It is possible, there's a bunch of tools for this. It is, it is possible to take a, a particular URL or a domain 
and get a list of all links from a particular wiki, say English Wikipedia, to that link or domain. There are people making lists of, by DOIs, I think Crossref are doing this sort of stuff, uh, making sort of the most cited DOIs on Wikipedia and making tables. There's also a project to find all the open access literature which isn't cited on Wikipedia and make those lists available because if something is, is peer-reviewed and it's a research paper, it probably belongs on Wikipedia somewhere, and so that's a useful list. So there is, I, I don't have the links to hand, but there are exactly those kind of bibliometric projects going on. I, I can try and find links to share with you. Talk to me afterwards. Thank you all very much. I think that's it. Thank you all very much for your questions.